Well, you can see who took the shortcut. No, no other idea. Always. Always. It's part of entrepreneurship. <laughs> Uh, welcome to Dirk. Uh, Dirk is from Hyperloop, tra Hyperloop Transportation Technologies. Uh, now I'm sure many of you were watching Dirk's presentation on the main stage just now. But for the benefit of those who weren't, Dirk, give us a very quick run through of what Hyperloop is. Okay, so do we have that half an hour? Yeah, <laughs> try and condense it. So, it depends if it's uh, a direct answer or a little bit broader, right? So, from a technology perspective, it's basically um, a train, a capsule, uh, inside a tube. Um, where you take the air out, so this train can move much faster at basically at the speed of sound um, with very little energy. And it's all powered by alternative energy, so it's very green, very cost efficient. Um, we have a lot, I mean, we have been working on this now for over three and a half years. The idea originally came from Elon Musk, or better, the idea has been around for quite some time, but he kind of like came out and said, hey, I really think someone should do this. We stepped up to the plate and started working on it. Um, yeah, and then, um, you know, we realized we had to make it into a movement, so we're using a very unique approach in uh, the way we're building the company, we have over 800 people all around the world. Most of them actually work in exchange for stock options in the company. Um, part of that are roughly 40 companies and some of the largest companies in the world. Um, we have a community of over 60,000 people that we crowdsource with, so we really found a completely new way of building a business with a distributed team, people that are that are driven by passion rather than dri being driven by money. Um, yeah, we realized we had to make it into, we had to do more than just build a company, we had to build a movement, and that's what we did. So we'll come on to the business model in a moment and how that works from a kind of tech perspective. When I was watching your presentation, there were three things that jumped out to me as being the benefits of hybrid. There's efficiency in terms of saving money, efficiency in terms of moving people from point A to point B, and there's efficiency in terms of sustainability and the environmental credentials. Which one's the most important for you? So, let's start with the last one for first. I think that everybody wants to be green, but nobody really cares if there's not an immediate benefit, right? So, um, you want to be green, but if it costs more, then you're not. Uh, if it's a hassle, you're not. In our case, we actually, you know, we're using alternative energy to create a huge benefit for the system, right? So we're able to have very low operational costs, and in certain areas, being even um, even energy net positive. So that's that's one. Personally, um, I think the opportunity of Building something that makes economical sense, it's the biggest advantage. What do, most, you, what do you mean by economic sense? Give us an example of, of why so, hyperloop is economically sensible. So most people are excited about the speed, right? And I can see that. You go from one place to another super fast, and that's great. But when I think about how public transportation, how transportation in general works, and the reason why we don't have good or great public transportation in most parts of the world. I mean, Singapore is definitely an exception, right? It's, uh, it's really great. I was yesterday with SMRT and uh, I saw some of the new, new projects. But at the end, they're relying heavily on, on government subsidies. So taxpayers are, are paying for public transportation. So nations and countries that are not as rich cannot have public transportation. In fact, in most countries around the world, when we talk about even Eastern Europe, right, not even, we don't have to go to Africa or uh, in, in other areas, they don't have a good public transportation network. It's not a problem to build them. It's not a problem to spend 10, 12, 20 billion dollars to build them, but then you have to maintain them. The New York Metro, as I said earlier on stage, costs $2.2 .2 billion every year. That's a lot of money, right? So, with Hyperloop, because you're using less energy, you're, again, you're inside a low-pressure environment, so you don't have the air resistance. 90% of high-speed trains 
energy consumption is actually the air resistance and only 10% of the wheels. Um, you're, so you, now you're consuming less energy and you're producing it through the alternative energy. In addition to that, again, we're in 2017 and we just heard artificial intelligence um, as an example, machine learning. I mean, there's a lot in innovation, there's a lot in uh, technologies that can be used today in public transportation that's not. Uh, there's no, you know, if we start to question everything and we start to think about, okay, how can we do things completely different? How can we do them better? Um, I'm sure that the people that are here in the room, the people that are outside, they're working on those technologies, have plenty of ideas, and that's exactly what we're doing. So it's green, it's economically efficient, and it gets people from one place to another super fast. Why are governments not snapping this up? What are the kind of snagging points? No, actually they are. Right. So, you know, again, we are, one of, the, one of the most important things for us, I think, was to not make it depend on one country, not make it depend on one company. So there's actually several companies out there trying to do the same thing. It's, you know, we have been very active with several governments around the world. I have personally met most of the world leaders from Putin to Angela Merkel to, you know, even Erdogan. Uh, I think we met most of the ministers of transportation or economy around the world. And everybody is very open. Everybody actually understands. I mean, again, it's kind of like when I come to you and I say, hey, you know, I want to save you money. Are you interested? No. You don't have to spend that much anymore. It's not going to cost you anything. Are you interested? So. And that's basically, you know, they, they, they know it's a huge problem. There's a huge percentage of uh, the household budget that goes towards transportation. China, for example, I mean, they're going very heavily on high-speed rail. High-speed rail is very expensive, um, but it's necessary in such a huge country, so they're justifying it with um, what they're doing to the economy. But if there's an alternative that now doesn't cost them as much money, you know, they're all for it. So where do you see Hyperloop going? I mean, we, you had in your presentation you know, a picture of London and we spoke at the back of the room about the high-speed rail developments in the United Kingdom. We talked about Los Angeles and traveling between areas of America. But you also mentioned Africa and China. Where do you picture it working? So first of all, we as a company are a little bit more than just a capsule inside the tube. Right? We're a technology company. We're not an infrastructure company. We're not going to start building Hyperloops everywhere in the world. We work with the local governments, the local transportation companies, to give them the technology to build the system. Um, some of the technologies that we're developing can be used in planes, cars, trains. We have inactive collaboration with Deutsche Bahn, for example, which is the German Railways, um, one of the largest transportation companies in the world. We're talking to several airlines to use the technologies and change really the way we're, we're, we're traveling. And if you think about um, I mean, just take an airplane. You're all this time, I was just 20 hours on an airplane to come here. And nobody really tried to entertain me by making, uh, making money. So, you know, and it's not that they're not thinking about it, but there's just no push. There's, uh, it's, you know, the, the, the problem that we have with existing industries is that, unfortunately, the management is paid based on the current results, not in the results in 10 years. So, it takes people like those people here in the room that are startup founders because as a founder you don't care about today, you care about what comes tomorrow, what comes in a year, what comes in 10 years, in 20 years even. You have a much larger vision. And um, you know, so we will see it, Hyperloop of course in my opinion a little bit everywhere. It's not going to replace rail. Some of these technologies are going to be used in rail. Um, the, the existing systems are still going to be around, but uh, new systems that are being built are probably going to be Hyperloops or other um, mobility systems and concepts that are out there. Let's talk about the business for a moment, because that's what many people in the room will be interested in. Elon Musk said, I've got this idea, bang, do something with it. And your company came along. How did it progress from there? Well, so I was part of a non-profit incubator that was funded by NASA and we had this idea of building a platform that allowed entrepreneurs to build a community around their projects, basically to find um, people that are passionate about the same thing. 
when Elon said, hey, you know, th I think this is a cool idea, someone should do this, I don't want to be the one doing it, I thought it's a perfect fit to try out what we want to do. <coughs> Um, so we put it onto the platform, we asked our community, should we be doing this? And most people not only said, yes, you should be doing this, but they actually said, hey, I want to be part of this. So we incorporated the company, got a small team together and said, everybody who would like to join and work in exchange for stock options with a minimum of 10 hours per week, please apply. We got around, I think, 200 applications, got a team together of around 100 engineers and started working on the feasibility study. Today, the company is more than 800 people all around the world. We have thousands of applications. We get roughly five a day. And, um, you know, it's growing. It's, uh, it's, it's really, I mean, it's moving forward. And everybody brings their expertise. So we have, it's very interesting because we have people that are retired, that are, you know, older, um, working together with students that just came out of university. So there's a knowledge transfer and there's also like a clash of worlds, which is very interesting. But you also have different expertises. So we have um, the saxophone player from Pink Floyd, for example, as part of our team. Um, we have a sculpturist, we have <coughs> psychologists, we have doctors, of course, a lot of engineers, but also marketers. And, you know, everybody kind of has their view and their field of expertise and if you think about it like everybody who's here you, you know one thing to do very very well and if you think about how you could make public transportation better so you're right in the bus you're right in the subway you're right in the in the plane in the car or in the hyperloop i'm sure you have some ideas and that's ex exactly how we work is it not a nightmare designed by committee I mean, Mark Zuckerberg had an idea with a couple of friends, and you know the Apple creators had an idea between like, two or three of them. But it's not so. It's it's not the democracy, or if you want. So you still have a founder, a management team that pulls the shots. It's not that we vote on everything, but we're open, right? So um, we're 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 basically everybody who has an idea can approach us if they want to join the team. If we like the idea, we might create a team, or if you know, we need that skill set, you might be joining a team. So, um, and the teams are managed again by others that, are, that have a little bit more time. So roughly, if roughly 80 people managing those 800, and um, you know, at the beginning it was challenging. We had to learn how to work this way because this has actually never been done before. Um, so, you know, you make errors, you learn, but it's still the best model that I can imagine. When, you know, before I had several companies and I was the founder or the CEO, I was always feeling like I was pulling the wagon, right? And my employees were on the back and, um, you know, I had to pull them. I was the one actually moving the business forward. Now, today, I, I'm still in front pulling, but there's people pushing. And, um, you know, even on a day where I'm tired or, you know, the life of an entrepreneur sucks because it's, you know, psychology-wise, you're on a high one day and on, on a down the next day. It's actually really, really hard um, if, if, if you're really in it to, um, to live this life because, you know, it's not so much about your sacrifices. People always talk about, oh, you're doing so, you sacrifice so much. It's about the sacrifices that you have other people do, right? So my kids, for example, like it's, I'm, it's not that I'm sacrificing not seeing them, it's my choice at the end, because I feel in that moment that meeting is more important and it's probably an error, but, but they are sacrifice, right? That where they say, hey, Papa, why don't you switch jobs? Um, and they don't really even know what I'm doing, but they don't like it. So, you know, as an entrepreneur, there's also the highs and lows. One day you th you're the king of the hill, and the next day you're like, this is never going to work. We're, we're doomed. It's like this for everyone. So it doesn't feel like it's all on your shoulders? It's, it's easier now because you have, again, you have people pushing. You're working in, um, with people that don't necessarily always look at you. It's not me, right? I'm just the one who can be here and is speaking. Maybe I set the vision and the strategy. But in general, it's literally a team effort. I mean, it's a whole company. It's, it's a movement, if you want so. And it makes things easier. It, it also creates some challenges from a management point of view, you're right, because people feel entitled. 
right? If you pay someone, you can say, hey, do this. If they're investing their time, they're like, why? So now you have to convince them why. Um, I think that I'm becoming, because I'm still, I don't think I'm there yet, a better manager because of that, because if you do that also when you're paying people and you get their buy-in, it definitely works better always. Why is now the right time for Hyperloop? So, there's a lot of answers to, this, to the question. From a technology point of view, we have everything for quite some time. There's some developments um, that have been made possible over the last couple of years. Vacuum technology, for example, it used to be very expensive. In, in, in fact, when you read most of the naysayer articles, they talk about like, yeah, this vacuum cannot be maintained, it's gonna cost too much. Um, it's cost three dollars for 10 kilometers, so today. And that's uh, because we have now vacuum technology that's very efficient. Battery technology is another thing. We have developed our own battery um, that was necessary to, to, for the system. And um, that's, you know, a couple of years ago, those batteries would have been way too heavier to move them in an efficient way. But today, it's possible. On a social level, I think we arrived to a point where, I mean, first of all, I think we live in exciting times because little kids today grow up and they want to be um, startup founders, right? They want to be the next Mark Zuckerberg. When I was a kid, we wanted to be soccer players or uh, rock stars. So I think that's great because we definitely need more brilliant minds. We have, transportation is becoming such a huge problem that governments are open to, to talk. They understand they need a solution can't continue like that. Um, innovation is at a point where large companies are actually looking at what's happening around them and they want to understand and learn and are open and collaborating. So all these things I think are kind of like aligned to, to make, to, to get to the next model. And um, well, and we are here, right? So it's, we have been doing some work for the last three years. So it's not something like now is the right moment but you're forming, you're getting out there, you're getting the word out there. You're trying to tell people, okay, look, we can do this all together. Uh, it's important, it's, it's a movement, so. Final question, what's your big dream for Hyperloop? Where, where would you like, I mean, the, the railway industry, you know, revolutionized the world over two centuries. What's your, your big dream? Well, to be honest with you, my kids live two and a half hours away, so uh, my big dream personally probably would be to have a Hyperloop to go see them within 10 minutes. Uh, unfortunately, they're in an area where it's not very likely that we're gonna, that that's gonna happen very soon. Um, again, I think um, more than dream, when, when it comes to dream, I think, I mean, I mean our model, which um, now is actually becoming a Harvard case study. Um, it has the potential to really change the world because we, have, we are in, in an amazing time where we have a lot of entrepreneurs. However, most of the entrepreneurs go out and try to solve or do a small thing. They wanna do the next Instagram, Snapchat, um, you know, WhatsApp and sell for 19 billion, which is great, but you're not solving the big, big challenges. And it's easy and I'm saying easy for a Jeff Bezos or an Elon Musk to change the world. You know, with a couple of billion dollars, it's easy for you to go out and say, hey, let's, let's change this. But how do you do this? You know, if you're not a billionaire, if you're not a millionaire, how can you change the world? And, uh, you know, that's where I see our model really coming in, changing this way that people now, you know, understanding how it works can go after the big issues and understand that money is not the most important thing. That it's more important to find people that share what, what you believe in and um, you can build these companies. Money will come. Money comes when you show results. And most of the times, very early on, you don't need really money. I mean, when we started, we didn't know if this even is possible. We needed to do a feasibility study. And people were asking us to invest. We said, no, 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 we, I don't know if, this, if we can do this. I didn't want it to be the one where people say, hey, you know, you, wanted, you were using Elon Musk's name and 
it didn't even work, and you know, we didn't know how much money we need, we didn't know if it was doable, so, but we had everything. We had people, we had tools, we were able to talk with sponsors, and we worked on the feasibility study. So that's, if you want so that dream. When it comes to Hyperloop, really, on the, on the other hand, in terms of a vision, for me, transportation will be free within three to five years. You're not going to be paying for at least local transportation. Um, there's other better ways of monetizing than uh, a ticket. And I think that's, ex that's exciting. So um, that's where we spend a lot of our efforts in to try to make that happen. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Dirk Alborn from Hyperloop Transportation Technologies.